Without food or even clothes, a skateboarding girl and a hunter face the challenge of surviving 21 days together in the perilous jungles of Nicaragua's Isabel Mountains at an altitude of 760 meters. The area is home to deadly fur de lance snakes and large cougars that can weigh up to 80 kilograms and leap at prey from 6 meters away. Jacqueline, 25 years old and a vegetarian for two years, has been practicing skateboarding barefoot to prepare for this 21-day wilderness survival challenge. She wonders if a vegetarian diet will sustain her until the end. Adam, 29, a professional hunting guide with special expertise in crocodiles, claims to understand the language of crocodiles. Before the challenge, his grandmother expressed a hope that the girl joining her grandson would be unattractive, humorously noting her deep understanding of her grandson. Jacqueline is currently single and somewhat uncomfortable with nudity, while Adam, who has a girlfriend, acknowledges her likely discomfort with the situation, but emphasizes that the necessities of food, water, and shelter are more important than sexual attraction. Both participants were shy upon meeting, speaking only a few words after an awkward initial encounter. Each contestant chooses one survival tool, Jacqueline with a fire starter and Adam with a machete, typical choices for such challenges. They are dropped deep in the mountains, planning to build a shelter near a river close to a waterfall. The jungle's hidden dangers will test Adam's hunting skills and both their survival abilities. Experts have rated their primitive survival skills, PSR, based on skills, experience, and psychological factors. Adam's score is 7.3, boosted by his tracking and hunting skills, but limited by his lack of experience in jungle environments. Jacqueline's score is 7.1, her plant identification skills being a strong point, though her vegetarian diet might hinder her protein intake during the challenge. On their way to find a suitable site for their shelter, Adam suggests that Jacqueline make some clothing for sun protection, reaffirming his commitment to his girlfriend and his primary goal of surviving 21 days. As they rush to finish their shelter by 5 p.m., rain begins to fall and temperatures drop, forcing them to huddle together for warmth. On the second day, the sun shone down on the earth. Jacqueline successfully started a fire with her fire starter. Adam used bamboo as a container to hold water, then boiled it. The clear river water was not far from the camp, convenient yet challenging due to the lack of dry wood, which kept the fire too weak to boil the water in the bamboo. Many lessons have taught us not to easily drink raw water from the wild. By 5 p.m., Adam, parched, asked Jacqueline if they could drink directly from the waterfall. Definitely not below, he said. Adam planned for them to rest well today and climb to the top of the waterfall tomorrow to drink. This plan would require a lot of energy as Adam and Jacqueline had to climb five kilometers to reach above the waterfall. During the journey, Jacqueline had to stop multiple times to rest and even started feeling faint. Just two and a half days into the 21-day challenge, they hadn't drunk any water. When they were only 1.6 kilometers away from a safe water source, Jacqueline showed signs of organ failure and early symptoms of acute dehydration. She barely made it up. Eventually, Jacqueline followed Adam and found a relatively safe water source. After hydrating, she felt much better and was grateful for the tough climb. She appreciated Adam's constant encouragement and emotional support, emphasizing the importance of a patient teammate to avoid conflicts. On the fourth day, with his energy still decent, Adam went out hunting. Meanwhile, Jacqueline collected some edible plants. At noon, Adam returned with two crabs, two snails, and an earthworm. Although not a feast, it was a delicacy for wilderness survival. Remember, Jacqueline is a vegetarian. She was surprised to see Adam enjoying the roasted snails, as she wouldn't even touch meat, let alone snails and worms. Adam didn't force Jacqueline to eat, knowing that in a few days, when she was extremely hungry, she would likely eat. The caloric difference between their first meals was significant. Jacqueline's food totaled at most 30 calories, while Adam's intake was at least four times hers. Most people need about 2,000 calories a day. Over the next three days, Adam and Jacqueline continued to forage for food separately. The weather gradually dried up, allowing them to boil water near the camp. However, the nightly cold still forced them to sleep close together. At such times, hearing strange noises was the last thing they wanted, especially with nearby cougars posing the greatest threat. On the night of the eighth day, they heard the roar of cougars around them. On the morning of day nine, they were still shaken. Adam decided to make a weapon 
His skills mainly involve identifying and tracking wild animals. Whenever he enters a new environment in the jungle, Adam can identify potential threats. Now, feeling threatened by cougars, he decided to patrol the area with his homemade weapon. After inspecting, he found numerous cougar tracks near the camp. They hadn't intruded on the cougar's territory. Instead, they had encroached upon it. Fortunately, while gathering food, Jacqueline discovered a hidden small cave ideal for shelter. After discussing with Adam, they promptly moved there. On the way, Adam caught a highly venomous lancehead snake with a stick. Jacqueline continued her vegetarian diet, so Adam ate alone at night. The only downside of the new cave was the abundance of bugs, making it hard to sleep at night. Jacqueline was bitten all over and felt irritable, especially since she was also on her period. Jacqueline maintained her vegetarian diet until day 17, but couldn't continue due to hunger. That day, Adam caught a small lizard. Unwilling to be hospitalized for starvation and to ensure the challenge's success, Jacqueline had no choice but to eat. From day one, Adam and Jacqueline got along harmoniously, just like the episode's title, Jungle Dependence. Jacqueline mentioned that if they met again, they could travel and adventure together, a hunter and a vegetarian, a fine pairing indeed. Finally, on day 21, they faced the perilous 10-kilometer descent. They had to navigate steep rocks and snake-infested streams before finding a small road. A truck loaded with bananas picked them up there, marking the end of their challenge. Throughout the 21 days, Adam lost 22 pounds and Jacqueline lost 16 pounds. Adam's excellent hunting skills helped them obtain essential protein. Jacqueline also proved she could make tough decisions for survival, like eating meat. Her rating increased from 7.1 to 7.5, and Adam's from 7.3 to 7.8. Harsh high temperatures and dangerous sharks are the biggest threats to the two challengers. The male contestant we see now is Jonathan, a 36-year-old from California. He was a Marine Corps scout and sniper, and continues to keep fit after retirement. Jonathan has also competed in eight triathlons, so he confidently says, I don't mind being naked because I'm in great shape. The female contestant cheering at the sight of the island is Allison, a 27-year-old surfer and survival expert. She describes herself as wild and adventurous, having visited some of the most remote and unique places on Earth. Allison doesn't mind the harsh environment, but she is a bit shy about being naked with her partner. She reveals that her former nickname was Nun, indicating her conservative nature. It's a common feeling to be embarrassed, unless you're as confident about your body as Jonathan. Jonathan immediately felt the pain of the sun on his skin after stripping, as he burns easily. Allison couldn't help but giggle as she approached him, feeling embarrassed by the unusual situation. After a brief and awkward exchange of greetings, they examined their survival tools. Jonathan chose a hand axe, while Allison opted for a fire starter, ensuring that starting a fire wouldn't be an issue. Besides their own cameras, a professional film crew is documenting their journey. These experienced photographers are used to capturing such scenes. Looking at the local map, there are two islands. The smaller one is where they landed, and the larger one, 1 1.6 kilometers away, is rich in resources. To survive 21 days, they must swim over, facing strong currents between the islands. Allison worries about encountering sharks, while Jonathan is concerned about sunburn in the sea. Although Allison is skilled at surfing and was not initially afraid of sharks, a close encounter with a 5.8-meter weasel shark changed her perspective. Their fear in the ocean is profound. This is not like swimming in an indoor pool. In the sea, they are completely unequipped and even lack clothing, truly embodying the fear of being naked. They made it to the larger island across the channel. Before the challenge, experts assessed the survival skills of both participants. Jonathan's military background was seen as an advantage, but his lack of social skills was a significant disadvantage. Allison's comprehensive survival skills and experience with various cultures worldwide were her strengths, though her lack of experience interacting with military personnel could lead to potential conflicts. Jonathan scored 6.9, and Allison scored 8.0. The experts pointed out Jonathan's poor social skills and Allison's potential difficulty in collaborating with a hardcore military man as their respective flaws. Upon starting the challenge, Jonathan's skin was already sunburnt, highlighting his sensitivity to the sun. Surprisingly, he lay down almost immediately, incapacitated by his sunburn on the very first day, 
which seemed rather negative. Fortunately, Allison was proactive. While Jonathan was unable to move, she took charge, keeping busy throughout. Jonathan considered quitting due to his severe sunburn. Despite being a survival expert and veteran, if he gave up, Allison would have to survive the remaining 18 days alone. However, Jonathan persisted the next day, determined not to quit, despite his pain. Allison tried to help by applying herbal remedies to his burns, though they were ultimately ineffective. Yet this act showed mutual care between the partners. As Jonathan struggled, Allison took on the responsibility of finding coconuts and ingeniously crafted a sunshade to prevent further sunburn. Their primary water source was coconut water, but excessive consumption could lead to dehydration due to its diuretic effect. While Allison worked hard gathering coconuts, Jonathan criticized her for not searching for fresh water, which seemed unfair given his lack of contribution. Allison handled everything from collecting coconuts to improving their shelter and fishing, all on her own. By day six, Allison could no longer cope due to menstrual cramps in the harsh environment. Meanwhile, Jonathan's sunburn had somewhat improved. Realizing he couldn't just lie around any longer, he started searching for fresh water. After digging in one spot with a hatchet for several days, he finally struck water. The water was murky and ideally needed to be filtered and boiled before drinking. They had flint for making fire, which made boiling water convenient. However, Jonathan, in his impatience, drank the water directly. This was a mistake, as he soon suffered from diarrhea. To make matters worse, he chose to relieve himself near their shelter, attracting a lot of flies and creating a foul smell. Allison stepped in it on her way back to the shelter and realized it was Jonathan's doing. This embarrassing incident was also going to be broadcast on their show. Allison gently advised him to relieve himself further away and cover it with sand. Jonathan, upset by the situation, retorted that he couldn't help having diarrhea. The argument over this issue was their most intense yet, straining their relationship. Allison even exclaimed that he lacked the skills to survive there. On day 13, while fishing together, Allison bravely killed an eel with a hatchet, crying as she did so because she disliked killing. Jonathan, seeing her bravery, admitted that despite his military background, Allison was more proactive and better suited to lead their survival efforts. Determined to contribute, Jonathan later managed to catch a clam by himself. By day 19, the eel and clam were their only sources of protein. They endured a storm as temperatures dropped sharply, making their final days particularly dangerous. Nevertheless, they successfully completed the challenge. Over these 21 days, Jonathan lost 8 kilons, Allison lost 6 kilons. Let's review the changes in their scores. Jonathan demonstrated great determination when injured, enduring despite not being very active, and increased his score from 6.9 to 7.3. Allison needs no extra mention. She raised her score from 8.0 to 8.4, a very high score. This season's challenge took place in the rainforests of Central America, Costa Rica. Before the challenge started, the show's producer, Steve, was scouting the site when he was bitten by a fear de lance snake. The venom quickly spread throughout his body. The crew quickly airlifted him to a local hospital where he underwent multiple surgeries and narrowly survived. After this serious incident, the production team and the contestants discussed whether to continue the challenge. Both participants hesitated but decided to proceed. The first to appear this season was Shane, a 40-year-old survival enthusiast. Shane grew up without his parents, spending 13 years in foster homes and boarding schools. The school took them on a wilderness survival trip, which unleashed a sense of freedom and Shane he had never felt before, leading him to fall in love with adventure. The female contestant this season is Jim, a 22-year-old survival instructor. Jim is academically trained with little actual wilderness experience. Seeing how thin Jim is, concerns arise since survival usually relies on fat reserves. Upon arriving at the challenge site, it was time to disrobe. Shane, being 40, expressed concerns about communicating properly with his 22-year-old partner. Jim's biggest worry was that her partner might be arrogant. Their initial meeting was filled with awkward and nervous small talk. Let's see what tools they brought. Shane brought a fire-starting tool. Jim brought a machete. Along with their cameras, a film crew followed them throughout, intervening only in case of emergencies. Now let's look at the map of the area a deep canyon covered in rainforest with a river winding through it. They relied on the sun for direction. 
aiming to cross the rainforest and set up camp near the river. After surviving 21 days, they plan to reach a waterfall a few kilometers downstream. Compared to previous episodes on islands and prairies, surviving in the rainforest poses significant challenges, including the fear of the unknown. Just finding the river could lead to getting lost and a prolonged search. Fortunately, they had a map. Let's look at the initial survival ratings for the two participants based on skills, experience, and psychology. Shane scored 7.6. Jim, lacking practical experience, scored 5.8. During the challenging journey to the river, Shane kept the conversation going to lighten the mood, asking Jim about her hobbies and her hometown's climate, which she described as cold. Shane, jokingly chiding Jim's conversational skills, revealed his troubled childhood, having been in five foster homes and four institutions, calling his younger self a hot-headed mess. Jim later confided to the camera that Shane talked a lot. Upon reaching the river, their first task was to build an elevated shelter, followed by starting a fire. Fortunately, both had the foresight to bring fire-starting tools, a crucial item in the rainforest. Their first day was relatively pleasant. Jim, who's slow to warm up, gradually became more comfortable with Shane, even considering a hug. However, the good start was short-lived as a torrential rain began, typical for Costa Rican rainforests, sometimes lasting for weeks. This rain lasted until the fourth day, during which they did little but stay in the shelter to keep warm by the fire. On the fifth day, the sun finally emerged, signaling time for hunting. However, a disagreement arose. Jim wanted to find food immediately, while Shane planned to improve the shelter. While division of labor is wise, it should ideally be done after securing food. It was not ideal sending Jim, a young girl with little survival experience, to hunt alone. Jim walked around the area several times without catching any food. She sat by the river, crafted a fishing trap, and made a small fish hook, but unfortunately, she caught no fish. When Jim returned to the shelter, she found Shane shaking on the ground, likely still affected by the previous day's downpour. By day nine, Shane had slowly recovered, and it was time to hunt. He found a meter-long poisonous snake in the bushes, pinned it down with two logs, and then killed it with a machete. The whole event was so thrilling that even the monkeys in the trees were stunned. The snake was a great catch. However, when Shane showed the snake to Jim, she casually remarked that it was just a small snake. This comment really annoyed Shane, who retorted that if she couldn't say anything nice, she shouldn't speak at all. Shane felt hurt, having tried his best to make Jim happy, but she seemed indifferent about how the snake was caught. Communication was indeed a challenge as both were not great conversationalists. Later, Shane slipped and almost fell down a slope while tracking a wild boar. If not for grabbing a branch, he might have been seriously injured. When he told Jim about the incident, she seemed more interested in whether he saw the boar and questioned the truth of his slip down the steep slope. Such incidents inevitably led to resentment and tension between them. On the 14th night, while Shane was sleeping, the shelter caught fire. Jim was supposed to watch the fire, but left for a moment, nearly resulting in Shane's death. The fire was a significant setback, almost leading them to abandon the challenge by day 16. Shane was visibly upset and sat in front of the shelter in a negative mood. Fortunately, Jim did not give up. At the river, Jim, driven by hunger, caught a turtle and had a satisfying meal. At this point, I wondered why this episode was called Jungle Curse. Was it the turtle that cursed them? Indeed, Jim suffered from food poisoning for several days after eating the turtle, becoming feverish and nearly incapacitated. During those days, Shane shouldered all the responsibilities. By day 20, when Jim recovered, Shane was exhausted. The pair struggled to share tasks in the final challenge of reaching a waterfall downstream. Although the path was not long, Shane moved slowly and with great difficulty. Despite his weakness, this made the victory all the more meaningful. To commemorate surviving 21 days in the Costa Rican rainforest, Jim smeared charcoal on herself as a symbol of their ordeal. After their successful challenge, let's see how much weight they lost. In just 21 days, Shane lost 20 kilograms and Jim lost 12 kilograms. Shane's survival rating increased from 7.6 to 8.4, while Jim's rose from 5.8 to 7.8. Both possess decent skills. Their only shortcoming was cooperation, which made these 21 days quite painful. This episode's challenge took place on Kalimantan Island, 
In one incident, a contestant fell severely ill and lost consciousness just from drinking clear lake water and had to be hospitalized. Let's start today's challenge. First up is this episode's female contestant, Julie, who is 30 years old, 193 center tall, a teacher, and an outdoor survival instructor. She is academically trained but lacks practical survival experience. The male contestant named Puma is 38 years old, an outdoor enthusiast, tattoo artist, and snowboarder. 20 years ago, Puma survived an accident while snowboarding in the wilderness thanks to his solid survival skills. Their introductions suggest both are quite capable. Upon arriving at the challenge location, the two contestants stripped down, had a brief chat. Let's see what survival tools they brought. Puma chose a machete while Julie opted for a cooking pot, but did not select any fire-making tools. Besides the cameras they carried, a professional film crew was there to document everything, reportedly returning to a hotel at night. It's unclear what the contestants did during these times. Next, let's examine the map. It marks their rescue location, situated six kilometers southwest down the river, where they need to reach after surviving for 21 days. The map also shows a clearing near the river to reach before nightfall, and the journey there is not easy, requiring continuous climbing and descending. Now, let's look at their initial survival skill ratings. These ratings are determined by experts based on skill, experience, and psychological factors. Puma has experienced surviving in extreme environments, but tends to take risks, sometimes ignoring basic survival rules. Julie, while a survival skills instructor, severely lacks practical experience. Therefore, Puma's rating is 7.1 and Julie's is 5.5. Both scores are not high. Now, it's time for them to prove their abilities through action. After trekking through rugged terrain, the two finally reach the river. In wilderness survival, it's crucial to plan the order of survival essentials. Now that they have water, should they start a fire first or build a shelter? They didn't bring a fire starter, but considering the mosquitoes and leeches in the jungle, they decided to build a shelter first, raised off the ground. However, just being off the ground wasn't enough. They were still bothered by mosquitoes at night. During their first night, as they slept close together, a wild boar appeared nearby. Wild boars, being nocturnal, can become aggressive when threatened. With tusks up to 10 centimeters long, they can easily pierce the human body. Since it was only their first day and they were not yet adapted, lacking hunting tools, and with poor visibility at night, Catching anything by hand was impossible. On the second day, they divided their tasks. Puma was responsible for making fire while Julie improved the shelter. Puma, with extensive experience in extreme environments, is well-versed in basic survival skills. He quickly started teaching how to make fire to the camera. However, despite the lessons, his attempts to start a fire failed because the area was too damp and the twigs too soft. Each contestant could carry one piece of survival equipment. A machete was essential, but choosing the second item was challenging. Bringing a flint meant no container to boil water, and a cooking pot was useless without fire. After Puma tired from making fire, Julie tried but also failed. The episode started with Julie teaching fire making at a survival school, but it proved much harder in the actual wilderness. Even an instructor like Julie struggled without real wilderness experience. Without fire, they couldn't boil water. They dared not drink the river water for fear of infections. At that point, Puma found a very clear water source. Feeling severely dehydrated, he drank without consulting Julie, taking a significant risk. It tasted great. Puma was quite interesting. He probably worried that Julie would advise against drinking, so he drank secretly. Back at camp, Julie was still trying to make fire. By the third day, Julie was weak from dehydration. Puma had relieved some of his thirst by secretly drinking and couldn't stand to see his partner suffering. He then found a cleaner water source. Rainwater filtered through soil. It wasn't very clean, but was better than the river water and what Puma had previously drunk. By the fourth day, they finally managed to make a fire. The fire not only boosted their morale, but also brought them good luck. In the following days, they got along very well, and everything went smoothly, continually catching food in their fish traps. On day six, Julie caught a small turtle. They were living quite comfortably, a rare start indeed. They weren't full, but at least they had some food. However, this good life didn't last long. First, the hopeful fire they had went out. It was a critical mistake, something that shouldn't have happened. Both were busy gathering food. 
and now they had to start a fire again. But the weather was against them. Shortly after the fire went out, the sky filled with dark clouds and thunder roared, making it impossible to start a fire. They could only wait for the rain to stop. Near their shelter, the ground was covered with dry, brittle branches. Just recently, a huge tree trunk fell three meters from them. In such conditions, Puma and Julie were at risk of hypothermia. By day eight, the rain stopped, but Puma developed severe weakness and a headache, his hands trembling. He developed a high fever at night, and his condition worsened. It was no longer a matter of endurance. Julie quickly contacted rescue. Local medical personnel arrived on day nine after the river levels went down. Puma's temperature had risen to 40 degrees Celsius. He had contracted a local bacterial infection, possibly cholera, typhoid, dengue fever, or malaria. Without timely treatment, these diseases could be fatal. Puma and Julie ate mostly the same food, except for the water Puma secretly drank. Puma's temperature kept rising, so the medical team cooled him in the water before taking him to the hospital. After Puma left, Julie was alone. If she could survive until day 21, it would be considered a successful challenge. However, it seemed unlikely she could continue. The first night without Puma, Julie managed to start a fire again. Having fire should have been hopeful, but there were still 11 days to go. With Puma gone, Julie had to do all the work alone. The only food source, the fish trap, was no longer lucky. She couldn't even catch a small crab. Alone and exposed in the wilderness, Julie couldn't sustain herself mentally or physically. Therefore, she gave up on day 18. It was a pity. They had started with difficulties in making fire but had great luck afterwards. Puma, who seemed experienced, sometimes took too many risks. Puma lost 7 kilograms in 10 days. Julie lost 14 kilograms in 18 days. Puma was discharged from the hospital seven days after the challenge ended. Julie continues to teach survival skills in her hometown. Due to the failed challenge, Puma's rating dropped from 7.1 to 6.1. Julie's rating decreased from 5.5 to 5.0. Today's Primitive Life 21 Days is set on a scenic, uninhabited island in Fiji. The beautiful scenery is deceptive. Beneath the clear waters lurk aggressive white tip and black tip sharks. In the shallow bays along the shore, venomous sea snakes also lie in wait. On the yellow boat, we see today's female contestant, Field, aged 34. She works in luxury retail and is a professional makeup artist. Field always looks exquisite and elegant because of her job, giving her a delicate appearance. However, appearances can be deceiving. Field is a self-reliant, tough girl. She has enjoyed hunting and fishing since childhood and is skilled in making fire and using weapons. Field is confident about this 21-day survival challenge. The male contestant this season is less confident. On the way to the uninhabited island, he was already nervous, anxious, and even a bit fearful. The man, Keith, aged 45, works in addiction and alcohol recovery. He is extroverted and likes seeking thrills. Keith served in the Army Reserve for 10 years and loves various outdoor sports. Keith says, I believe I can survive under any conditions. But he added, It's too hot here on an island and I lack experience. I might fail. Field was a bit worried before meeting Keith, concerned he might see her as just a pretty face with poor survival skills. In fact, Keith was indeed attracted by Field's beauty. His only concern was that Field's fair skin might easily get sunburnt. Each contestant is allowed to bring one piece of equipment. Keith brought a machete, and Field brought fire-making tools. Next, let's look at the nearby map. Keith and Field were dropped in a desolate area. They need to walk through grassland covered with rough, serrated grass to reach the beach on the other side of the island. There, they will find food and freshwater resources. After the 21-day survival challenge, they need to leave the camp, cross the island's eastern side, pass areas inhabited by moray eels and sea snakes, and finally climb steep volcanic cliffs to await rescue. Now let's look at Keith and Field's survival ratings. These survival skill ratings are based on the challenger's skills, psychology, and experience. Keith has extensive experience in survival and outdoor adventures, earning him high scores and experience. However, his thrill-seeking personality leads to instability and lack of focus. Field scores well in problem-solving and perseverance, but prefers not to rely on others, which could affect her relationship with her partner. Therefore, Keith scores 6.3 and Field 6.1, barely passing with low scores. Upon reaching the beach on the other side of the island, they quickly found a water source. 
Due to the intense heat, they needed to drink quickly. Keith started a fire and cut some bamboo to boil water in. The first day progressed smoothly, a good start, but survival is never that easy. Despite having fire, fresh water, and bamboo containers, they couldn't boil the water and dared not drink it. This situation was new to them. When faced with the inability to boil water, they decided to keep trying instead of getting discouraged. Unable to drink, they also had to build a shelter to rest and search for clean water the next day. Without the ability to boil water, they ventured deeper inland to find a drinkable water source. Keith planned to cut down a banana tree, leaving 15 to 20 centimeters above the ground, and hollow out the middle to collect water. They used a rolled leaf as a makeshift straw. Keith almost choked on his first sip. The water tasted like battery electrolyte, making them thirstier. Failing that, they looked up and saw a coconut tree. Coconuts are a resource on the island, but reaching them was challenging. Keith decided to chop down the coconut tree, which was very labor-intensive. After much effort, he succeeded. But all the coconuts were green and contained no liquid, leaving Field puzzled and frustrated by the wasted effort. A sense of defeat loomed over them both. By the third day, both were severely dehydrated. They found a small stream on the beach and, thinking it was rainwater, they drank from it without hesitation. This confused me. Previously, they didn't dare drink the water they tried to boil with bamboo because it hadn't boiled. Yet now they were drinking from the stream. On the fourth night, heavy rain fell from the sky. They were desperate for water but hadn't prepared to collect rainwater in advance. Field tried to collect the remaining rainwater from crevices in rocks, but it wasn't much. Also, Field was working alone. Keith had diarrhea from drinking the stream water the day before and was in severe stomach pain, spending the day lying in the shelter. Because of this, Keith considered quitting. He admitted he couldn't adapt to every environment, which was much harder than he thought. By the sixth day, thoughts of leaving surfaced. Field didn't want Keith to leave and comforted him suggesting they could take it slow, like fixing their shelter first. Encouraged by his partner, Keith said to the camera that he would use the resolve he teaches others in overcoming addiction to face each day, breaking it down to an hour or even a minute if necessary. His words were motivational. However, when their fish trap came up empty and the stream water ran out, their morale dropped again. Due to dehydration, their vision blurred and tempers flared. At this point, Keith recklessly attempted to catch a sea snake with a machete, despite lacking the ability. He liked the thrill, or perhaps used it to mask his incompetence. Dehydrated and without food, they started blaming each other. On the eleventh day, Keith suffered spasms and became delirious. Field quickly called for medical help, and Keith was taken to the hospital. Diagnosed with severe dehydration and acute exhaustion, doctors suggested he remain hospitalized. With Keith gone, Field was left alone for the last ten days. Despite the difficulties, Field, a very strong girl as she described herself, made a fishing spear and ventured into the shallow dangerous waters to try catching small blackfin sharks. Although the sharks were small, their thick skin made it impossible for her to pierce them with her strength. With limited food in the area, Field survived on bananas and small crabs, and even ate termites in the final days. With remarkable perseverance, Field endured for 21 days and successfully climbed a volcanic cliff to complete the final challenge. Field became the first contestant to persevere alone after her partner left. Keith withdrew midway, losing 16 kilograms in 11 days, while Field lost 15 kilograms in 21 days. Field's score increased from 6.1 to 7.0, whereas Keith's dropped from 6.3 to 4.5, a rather embarrassing score. It's uncertain if Keith will still claim he can survive in any environment. Today's challenge is set in the heartland of South America, Bolivia, between the towering Andes Mountains and the perilous Amazon rainforest. The female contestant making her appearance is Sabrina, a 30-year-old who has never left the United States. Surprisingly, her first trip abroad is to such an extreme environment. Sabrina is married with three children. Many married individuals, including newlyweds, participate in this show. Would you let your significant other join, or would you convince them to let you? Sabrina considers herself a modern American witch. We'll soon find out why. The male contestant is Vincent, a 49-year-old full-time survival instructor. Vincent claims he might be one of the best survivors in the world. Confidence is good, but claiming to be one of the best might be overreaching. After their introduction, 
we'll see what tools each brought. Vincent has a wooden container, useful for carrying water and making fire by friction. Sabrina brought a small hatchet. Now, let's follow the cameraman and see the contestants' skills. Sabrina and Vincent are placed at a riverbend, cutting through dense jungle. They need to travel 13 kilometers downstream to a box canyon area rich in survival resources. Surviving in the rainforest is much harder than on islands. The last time this show visited the Amazon, three contestants were frightened off. Dropping rookies into tough scenarios creates good viewing but complicates things. If contestants leave within a week, what's the point? Hence, the scores are not low this time. Vincent scores 8.2, Sabrina 6.7. On the way to the valley, Vincent acted like a teacher, explaining survival skills to Sabrina. He taught her how to apply mud on her skin as sunscreen and how to carefully walk in shallow water. Sabrina felt annoyed, questioning the necessity of mud for sun protection in the rainforest. By the end of the first day, they hadn't reached the valley and quickly built a shelter to spend the night. They planned to follow the river at dawn. Though the river was right before them, they couldn't drink directly from it due to contamination and the hot climate. Sabrina experienced severe stomach pain, and Vincent used eucalyptus leaves to alleviate it. The oil from the leaves eased her cramps, and after resting, Sabrina recovered. They successfully reached the valley and joyfully bathed under a small waterfall. On the other side of the valley, water continuously flowed through porous sandstone, clean but still potentially hazardous. After thoughtful consideration, they decided to risk building a shelter there. Why was building a shelter considered a risk? The valley was box-shaped with cliffs on three sides, making it dangerous during the rainy season. They completed their shelter before nightfall and managed to start a fire, just as the sky grew overcast and winds picked up. A heavy rain could destroy their shelter, prompting Sabrina to suggest building a surrounding wall. While working together, conflict arose again. Sabrina criticized Vincent for constantly lecturing her like a teacher or boss and told him to shut up. Vincent, feeling extremely criticized, went hunting alone during the day without informing Sabrina, citing her constant complaints about the heat and cold as annoying. Vincent caught a small bird after hunting all day, which also upset Sabrina. By the eighth day, their only food sources were this small bird and some berries, with Vincent always hunting while Sabrina stayed at the shelter. She created a mysterious circle, not for food, but in response to the bird they ate together. Sabrina felt infinite sadness and a bad omen when she saw the bird killed, believing it was a sign of bad luck, and created the circle to ward off misfortune. Vincent was puzzled by her actions. After returning from hunting, he found the shelter decorated with witchcraft items. In the following days, Vincent made a spear and fished in the river, a routine task. Sabrina remarked that if it were her husband, he would have hunted in the jungle instead of wasting time in the river. This clearly showed the deep-seated conflict between them, as they could hardly stand each other. On the eleventh day, a torrential rain began. They could do nothing but take shelter and keep warm by the fire. The waterfall behind them swelled after three days of rain, but it didn't threaten their shelter. They could only hope that it wouldn't rain in the days to come. After the storm, Vincent's condition worsened significantly. He could no longer hunt outside as before and was weak, lying in the shelter. Despite previous conflicts, it was time to support each other and complete the challenge. However, they lacked communication. Even as Vincent collapsed, Sabrina did nothing. Vincent, suffering from dehydration, malnutrition, and fatigue, could no longer stay conscious. After a medical check, Vincent insisted he could continue. By the sixteenth day, with no food, the situation was dire. Sabrina did not step up to find food and mentally collapsed after Vincent fell ill. Vincent did not want to severely harm his health for the challenge and admitted defeat on the 16th day, leaving Sabrina to survive alone. Sabrina, lacking the capability to face the wilderness alone, also struggled. Every time before fishing, Sabrina prayed but found no substantial food. By the 20th day, Sabrina suffered severe abdominal pain, possibly from a serious infection or appendicitis. Medics had to evacuate her immediately. Over 16 days, Vincent lost 9 kilograms and Sabrina lost 4.5 kilograms in 20 days. Despite performing much better than previous contestants, they still failed. Given their survival and cooperation skills, I think their scores should be significantly reduced, especially Sabrina's. However, experts believed Sabrina bravely persevered for 20 days. 
so her score increased from 6.7 to 7.5. Vincent's score decreased from 8.2 to 7.1. This beautiful lady is this season's female contestant, Kelly, who is 25 years old. The male contestant is 40-year-old Tom, a family-oriented retired veteran. He joined the competition to set an example for his children. Kelly is also a veteran, formerly a Marine, and currently works as a part-time model. Kelly and Tom will be dropped on the west bank of the Matuk River, located in the densest jungle in southern Cambodia. The area is hot and humid, home to various spiders, venomous snakes, and fierce crocodiles in the river. Upon arriving at the competition site, the contestants strip down to face each other naked. Despite their gentle appearances, it's surprising that they don't argue. Kelly appears quite shy. Each contestant is allowed to bring one survival item. Tom brought flint and Kelly brought a machete. Let's take a look at the map. The first thing for Kelly and Tom is to find water and a place to stay overnight. Their best option is to head inland, through the snake-infested jungle, to a tributary in this area. Before the challenge, Experts evaluated the contestants based on skills, experience, and psychological aspects, assigning them a preliminary survival rating, PSR. Both contestants scored points for their military backgrounds. Tom, a former officer with leadership experience, scored 6.6. .6. Kelly, strong-willed with a comprehensive set of survival skills, scored 6.4. The scores are not high due to their lack of wilderness survival experience. Experts mentioned that Tom's leadership might not be advantageous, as all the female contestants are strong-willed and opinionated. If Tom insists on being a leader, it might not be beneficial. At the start of the challenge, they both had a reasonably good impression of each other. The Cambodian jungle is home to over 30 types of snakes, including the formidable King Cobra, which can grow up to 5.5 meters long and move its head at speeds up to 80 kilometers per hour. At 2 p.m., the pair found a flowing stream and a clear rocky area, ideal for building a shelter. Nearby bamboo and vines make excellent materials for construction. However, nights in Cambodia can be very cold without clothing, and the best course of action is to start a fire quickly. Tom successfully started a fire, but it was still very cold sleeping in the unfinished shelter. Kelly wanted to cuddle with Tom for warmth, but he kept his distance, refusing to embrace anyone other than his wife a decision that speaks to his character but left Kelly very cold. She just wanted to warm up, as the nights here are unbearably cold. Tom's refusal to share body heat seemed absurd. This show has made it clear. Those who start off struggling might end up doing well, while those who seem to have a smooth start face continuous trouble from day one. Some contestants struggle terribly without fire, while others, even with fire, suffer immensely. The next day, Kelly was still fearful of the night's cold. Tom made it clear to her that he feared his wife getting angry, so they could not get close. This added an invisible distance between two strangers. Who do you think is to blame here? Nearby bamboo makes a great container for boiling water. Once the water boils, it's safe to drink. Both contestants are energetic and should be out hunting and gathering food. But since making fire, their progress has slowed. They just improve their shelter and drink hot water every day. Kelly is restless. She doesn't want to spend 21 days near the shelter starving. She wants to explore and forage, not return home and tell friends she just sat on a rock for 21 days. Kelly is full of ideas, but Tom seems indifferent. He prefers to stay in familiar areas, but brother, no food means even familiar places are no good. This caused a disagreement. Kelly didn't care and went out alone. Before she left, Tom asked her to bring back some firewood. After exploring alone for a while, Kelly reached a small river cove. Though the scenery was nice and open, it was very dangerous with crocodiles nearby. Kelly caught many clams there and returned happily to share with Tom, who did not care and remained upset. When he saw the clams, he wasn't happy and asked about the firewood Kelly had forgotten, focused only on finding food. If I were Kelly, I'd be angry too. I bring back food and you're ungrateful, blaming me for not bringing firewood. What were you doing at home? During the clam roasting, Tom kept instructing Kelly on what to do. Kelly couldn't take it anymore and sat down to talk with Tom. Communication didn't solve the problem, it only worsened it. I wanted to see you display some survival skills, Tom said. I haven't seen any. And you tell me you could build the shelter yourself. I could tear it down, and you can try making it again to see how it turns out. Besides chopping bamboo and collecting wood, what else can you do?
Let me analyze this. Tom wants to survive in his own way, which is to barely survive for 21 days. This method has its merits but is too risky without food and loses the meaning of the challenge. When Kelly confronts Tom, he responds by saying, I made the fire. I built the shelter. Isn't that enough? Neither wants to compromise. On day eight, they cooperated to collect clams together. However, they ended up arguing over a trivial matter on the way back. Eventually, they each did their own work, with one working while the other lay around, never offering any help. This mutual anger only left them hungrier. By day 18, Tom finally compromised a bit. He volunteered to go out and find clams to eat. This time, however, Kelly chose to stay and gather firewood. Tom brought back seven clams, two of which were dead. After starving for many days, a few small clams were hardly enough to eat. By now, the challenge was nearly complete, but they were close to failing. On the final day, day 21, they should have left early for the rescue location. Instead, they waited for the water in the bamboo to boil. While waiting, Kelly nearly burned her hands boiling water, and Tom just watched without helping. Frustrated, Kelly walked away. Tom had to search for her for quite a while, which was risky. The helicopter had to return to base before dark, and it was already afternoon when they finally set off. They took a wrong turn because they didn't check the map, but fortunately the helicopter kept searching and eventually rescued them. Although Kelly and Tom completed the challenge, their poor performance significantly lowered their primitive skills scores. Kelly's score dropped from 6.4 to 4.8, and Tom's from 6.6 .6 to 5.4. It was the first time I saw scores drop so much in a successful challenge. Why bother arguing so much? It's a bad example for children watching the show. After the show, Kelly returned to her modeling career at home, and Tom went home to recuperate. Today, our focus shifts to a deserted island in Dominica where the new female contestant, Colin, 32, from California, an extreme sports athlete and nutritionist, appears. Colin has always loved outdoor survival and is a skilled obstacle racer, very confident in her mental toughness. The male contestant, Chris, 38, a commercial fisherman and former Marine, has learned survival skills from a young age, especially during his four years in the Marines. His most confident survival skill is making fire using primitive methods, claiming he can successfully start a fire within one to two hours. Upon arrival at the challenge site, the next step is to undress. Chris, confident in his physique and indifferent to being naked, also hoped for an attractive female partner. I wouldn't say Chris is lecherous. At least he's honest about his thoughts. This is the American dream, you know? The only thing better would be two naked women. Okay, buddy. Let's end that fantasy there. Let's first see what survival tools each of you has brought. Each contestant is allowed to carry one item. Colin brought a cooking pot, and Chris brought a knife. Now let's look at the map. We are on an uninhabited island in Dominica, known for its sharp volcanic rock terrain. The narrow coastline is lined with steep cliffs, and the island is scarce in resources. The contestants can only risk entering the shallow sea areas to hunt, exposing them to various dangerous creatures. Venomous sea urchins, highly aggressive bull sharks, and Portuguese man of wars A sting from a jellyfish can cause fever and shock. These are the dangers the contestants will face. In the initial phase of the challenge, the focus is of course on finding water and building shelters. They quickly found a water source by digging beside a riverbed to access relatively clean groundwater. While searching for a shelter, they hesitated continuously, debating between living in a cave or building a small tent. As the day was almost ending, they finally decided to build a shelter on an open piece of land by themselves. Before participating in the challenge, survival experts evaluated the contestants based on skill, experience, and psychological aspects, assigning them a Primitive Survival Rating, PSR. Chris, with his extensive wilderness survival experience, received a PSR of 7.1, though his personality might clash with his partner. Colin, a competitive athlete but lacking wilderness survival experience, scored 6.1. The wind is strong here, so extra effort is needed in building the shelter. Once the shelter is built, they can rest. However, during the process, the two had their first disagreement. What happened? Colin had her own ideas for the shelter, which she shared with Chris. Chris didn't adopt any of her suggestions, thinking they were useless and would make the shelter very fragile. Chris likes to lead and is very direct. He believes in doing things his way without compromise, 
which would be perfect with a submissive partner. But that wouldn't be interesting. Despite her petite appearance, Colin is very strong-willed and independent. After Chris repeatedly refused to implement her suggestions, Colin, frustrated, went to the sea to bathe. They are both over 30, such a minor issue shouldn't be a big deal. Regardless, the shelter was eventually built. Colin woke up shivering from the cold late the next night. It's really cold, she muttered. The wind was strong outside and it was impossible to stay warm without fire. Starting a fire is Chris's forte. He claimed he could get a fire going in one to two hours. If that's true, there wouldn't be any rush to start one today. Quietly, Colin asked, What if the fire doesn't start, big brother? Chris replied confidently, It won't fail, trust me. Let's not rush the fire. We'll go get some food from the sea first. They then built a fishing trap together. After setting it up, Chris went deeper into the sea to place the trap. As a fisherman, it was uncertain how many fish Chris could catch over the 21 days. Later, they ate a sea urchin raw by the shore. I've never tried sea urchin. It probably isn't tasty, said Colin. Eating raw isn't a solution. Now it's finally time to start the fire. Chris, please begin your performance. Smoke appeared, but Chris's technique seemed off. The rope for his bow drill snapped before a fire started. It was an unexpected setback, or else they would have had a roaring fire by now. Colin scoffed from the side. So much for the expert. It only takes an hour at home, but it doesn't work here. Let's try my method. Colin suggested the fire saw method. I think this method might be worse than the bow drill, Chris remarked. Despite their efforts, they failed to start a fire. Over the next few days, Colin tried multiple times without success. Sister, some things need the right technique. Brute force won't work, Chris said. Failing to start a fire was a major setback for Colin. She broke down in tears on camera. No food and the cold nights are too much for me, she cried. Colin had said she could handle and endure any situation, but in reality, she couldn't. The lack of fire gradually wore her down, and the empty fishing trap didn't help. Chris noticed Colin's negativity and wanted to communicate, but Colin refused to speak to him just because he hadn't started a fire. Why can't you act like a man and get the fire going, she lamented. A team should face difficulties together, not blame one person, Chris thought. Though he had boasted at the start, he was genuinely trying to start a fire and wasn't slacking or being negative. Colin, however, was too frustrated to communicate and even disappeared for a while. This was clearly not the way to handle the situation. On day 13, Colin could no longer endure hunger and the cold. She approached the show's producer, announced her withdrawal, and left the challenge. Now, only Chris remained. Chris was furious about his partner's sudden departure. He almost smashed the camera. Fortunately, a cameraman intervened. Channeling his anger into motivation, Chris crafted a new bow drill and quickly started a fire shortly after Colin left. On day 17, Chris caught a large crab. Cooking and eating it was incredibly satisfying. The crab provided Chris with the energy needed to complete the challenge. By day 21, he had to walk 3.2 kilometers along steep cliffside shores to reach the southern beach for rescue, marking his success. Due to difficulties with the rescue boat reaching the shore, Chris swam out to it, completing the challenge successfully. Colin lost 10 pounds over 13 days, and Chris lost 20 pounds in 21 days. Chris's rating increased from 7.1 to 7.9, while Colin's dropped from 6.1 to 4.9. Today's episode of Primitive Living 21 Days is set near the Himalayan region in Kumon, northern India. The location is a hill covered with pine forests with cold air from the Himalayan glaciers, causing heavy rain below, leading to temperatures dropping below 10 degrees at night. Without clothes, the cold would be unbearable. The contestants face threats from Asian black bears, fierce leopards, and venomous saw-scaled vipers. This episode features male contestant Hajin, a 36-year-old martial arts expert and Iraq war veteran with extensive wilderness survival skills, proficient in fire-making, shelter-building, and hunting. The female contestant is Fredea, a 27-year-old survival expert who has lived a nomadic life with her father since childhood. Fredea shared, As a child, my father raised me in a communal, open-air environment. Nature is my home, and being naked in nature is nothing new to me. My only concern is the cold. The contestants arrived at the challenge site, facing the cold wind. They undressed and met each other. Each contestant could bring one survival item. Fredea brought a lighter, and Hajin brought an axe. Starting from an altitude of 1370 meters, 
Hajin and Fredea needed to climb an additional 600 meters to reach a large canyon, set up camp, and find water sources. The higher they climbed, the thinner the air became, accelerating dehydration and making breathing more difficult. The first day involved mountain climbing, which proved to be extremely challenging. Fredea had to stop halfway to rest. By 5 p.m., they had reached an altitude of 1950 meters, where they could proceed with their plans. They disagreed on whether to start a fire or build a shelter first. Fredea, shivering from the cold, wanted to start a fire for warmth, but Hajin disagreed, believing that they could survive without fire for the night, but not without a shelter. Hajin felt that in wilderness survival, priority should be given to protecting oneself by building a shelter to stay safe from the dangers of the wild. After the shelter was constructed, Fredea successfully started a fire with a flint. The first day ended smoothly as both critical tasks were completed. However, due to a lack of time during the day to gather sufficient wood, they barely slept at night, constantly worrying about the fire going out. The next day, Fredea and Hajin followed a stream near their camp, hoping to find a drinkable water source. After a full day's search without success, Fredea, weakened by dehydration, chose to drink directly from the stream flowing beneath the rocks. The stream water could contain bacteria or parasites, potentially causing dysentery and other fatal gastrointestinal diseases. It's difficult to find clean water in the wild, and boiling it before drinking is advisable. Despite not wanting to boil the water, Fredea and Hajin traveled far, but Fredea eventually gave in and drank the stream water. Soon after, she was doubled over with severe stomach pain, vomiting, and suffering from diarrhea. Fredea chose not to quit, but persevered. During this time, Hajin didn't complain, but took care of Fredea while maintaining their survival. Continuing this way, they likely wouldn't last the 21 days. Fredea's quick recovery was crucial for the success of the 21-day challenge. Before the competition, experts rated the contestants based on skills, experience, and psychology. Hajin, with military experience, scored 6.8, while Fredea scored 6.2. Hajin's score might seem low, but Fredea's could drop significantly due to her unsafe drinking choice. Now, it was about completing the challenge. After three days of vomiting and diarrhea, Fredea suffered greatly both physically and mentally. As a tough woman who wanted to excel in the wilderness, she really didn't want to give up. Fortunately, her teammate Hajin, with his military background, wouldn't easily abandon a comrade. Using sand and stones from the riverbed, Hajin filtered the stream water for Fredea to drink. Due to severe dehydration from vomiting and diarrhea, Fredea urgently needed to replenish her fluids. There might not be suitable containers nearby to store water, raising the question of why they didn't just boil some water to drink. Regardless, Hajin proved to be a supportive partner. After a while, Fredea felt somewhat better. At that time, Hajin was rebuilding the shelter. Fredea, puzzled and somewhat annoyed, asked Hajin, Why are you building the shelter again? Have you gathered enough wood for the fire tonight? It gets very cold, and the fire always goes out by midnight. I keep waking up freezing. Hajin believed it was okay if the fire went out. Worrying about the fire all night is the real mistake, he said. Hajin was the only one working and couldn't do everything. Fredea, please don't complain. The rebuilt shelter looks very warm. On the fourth day of the challenge, Fredea was still curled up in pain. Hajin called the doctor and the production team began assessing her condition. Fredea had contracted dysentery but didn't need hospital treatment. She could continue if she wished, supported by her teammate. Despite this, Hajin suggested, I think you should withdraw. Your condition is severe, and since you've been down, you can't do anything. It's hard enough for me to survive, let alone take care of another. Fredea, a strong girl, didn't want to give up or admit defeat. Her perseverance was admirable. By the eighth day, she had recovered somewhat and even helped Hajin build a fireplace for warmth. After completing the fireplace, Fredea caught a small crab in the creek, barely 40 grams of meat, providing only about 20 calories and 4 grams of protein each if shared. But it was better than nothing. By the twelfth day, they had built a very sturdy shelter enough to withstand the harsh nights of North India. However, their food supply was still meager, which wasn't surprising given the sparse resources near the mountains. There probably weren't any fish in the creek. Fredea started eating earthworms raw, which were uncomfortable to swallow and got stuck in her throat. 
On the fifteenth day, Freydea found a dead bird in the creek, a red-billed blue magpie. Although there wasn't much meat, it was enough for them. The cause of the bird's death was unknown, and it might have carried diseases like avian flu or encephalitis. But for two extremely hungry people, not eating it was not an option. They took the bird back, cooked it, and shared the meat. Eating meat was certainly better than eating earthworms. I'm getting hungry now. I'll buy a chicken leg for dinner. In the previous episodes, every team essentially survived on an empty stomach, and this season's contestants were no exception. After they finished the bird, it seemed unlikely there would be another meal during the challenge. However, Hajin's shelter was exceptionally well built. It wasn't just a simple hut. It was a structured wooden cabin with a small fireplace. Staying inside by the fire during the rain really made them fearless. The final stage of the competition was evacuation. They needed to descend 600 meters and travel approximately 8 kilometers, then cross a dangerous stream to reach the road below. Just at this crucial moment, Ferdea's dysentery flared up again. Hajin almost thought he would have to carry Ferdea out, but her strength surprised him. Despite abdominal pain, she walked ahead of Hajin and ultimately completed the challenge. Ferdea truly pushed her physical limits. Interestingly, the van that picked them up was loaded with many chickens, making them crave chicken legs for their return meal. After a tough 21-day challenge, Ferdea lost 20 kilograms, and Hajin, who never complained, lost 36 kilograms. He was indeed a great teammate. Now let's look at the survival scores. Hajin went from 6.8 to 7.4, and Ferdea from 6.2 to 6.9. It's curious how the experts rated them. Perhaps they thought Hajin's lower score was due to less hunting. A score of 7.4 does seem a bit low, 